Before I introduce the panelists, I would also like to uh, thank uh, Nilima Pat for uh, assisting us and supporting us in organizing this event. And so today's um, dialogue will be anchored by Preeti Dimello and Rakhuan Antanarayan. So Preeti is a scholar of Advaita Vedanta, and she synthesizes Eastern and Western approaches to personal development and spiritual integration and seeks to establish congruence between head and heart for meaningful development. She's also recognized for design thinking in systemic organizational and leadership development work. Uh, welcome Preeti to uh, the session. Uh, then we have a uh, co-anchoring uh, and facilitating this dialogue with Preeti is uh, Sri Rakhu Anantanarayanan. He's a di direct disciple of Yogacharya Sri T. Krishnamacharya and has been focusing on sharing his knowledge and insights into Antaranga Yoga or inner work through yoga over the last many decades. Raghu's abiding interest in the question of what is India was triggered by his years of contact with Dharampalji and he has been engaged with grassroots developmental work and has, and has enabled development of many crafts groups and a Tamil theatre group called Kutupatre. He has also delved deeply into behavioural sciences to develop a unique approach to personal unfolding and organizational transformation. Welcome, Rakhu, to this dialogue and the session. Hey, we Hari, are... Hari, can we ask each of the panelists to just say uh, hello to the group so that the window lights up and everyone knows who it is? Oh, yeah. So maybe sure. starting with Preeti. Yes, Preeti. Uh, Hi, Thanks. everyone. Yeah. Good to be here. And just for uh, all of you who are, have logged in, if you keep the speaker view, you'll be able to see the uh, speaker when they speak instead of the gallery view. Yeah. Rekhu, would you like to say? Yeah. Hello, everybody. Glad to be here. Thanks. And a little nervous, I must say. <laughs> okay. So uh, along with Preeti and uh, Rekhu, we also have three more panelists who will be uh, engaging in this dialogue. And so we have with us Rajini Bakshi. She's a freelance journalist and author, and she writes about social and political movements in contemporary India. She was formerly the Gandhi Peace Fellow at Gateway House, Indian Council on Global Relations. Welcome, Rajini. Yeah, thank you so much. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. <coughs> we have also with us uh, Sukhvinder Sarkar, She's an accredited group process facilitator and life coach, and her deep understanding of human behavior and aspirations supports her facilitation work. She's also popular for her divine feminine workshops. Welcome, Sukhvinder. Uh, you need to unmute yourself. Namaste and Radhe Radhe. Thank you. And we have with us Naveen Vasudevan. He's the co-founder of Ritampara and founder of Purnam. His interests include evolutionary leadership, integral psychology and process work. And he's particularly keen on working with young change makers and those interested in bridging spirituality and social change. Welcome Naveen to the discussion. Thanks, Hari. Uh, great to be uh, here. Uh, hi, all of you. Thank all you. right. So, so that's our uh, panelists for the day and uh, I'm handing over the proceedings to Preeti so that she can initiate uh, the introduction to this, what this program is about, more on the theme and take it further. Thank you. Thank you, Hari, and a very, very warm welcome to all of you. Before we begin, on behalf of Raghu and myself and our panelists Rajni, Naveen and Sukhvinder, and our wonderful colleagues, Anuradha, Hari, and Apurva. I would like to acknowledge Nilima Bhatt, Kristen Enwing, and Kiran Reddy for pulling together the Truth and Reconciliation Weekend. That is what we are currently participating in. And what's exciting is that this event has gotten us started and brought us on this path of this very, very imperative dialogue uh, that has been uh, long in the making. So some of us are here today as active explorers of Indic culture. 
both outer and inner dimensions, and others are drawn by curiosity around the topic of Indic heritage. A very warm welcome to each one of you. Let's get started. Our panel, as Hari has already introduced us to, um, spans across the domains of history, yoga, psychology, Advaita Vedanta, the divine feminine, and most importantly, our own personal lived experience. So the way we're going to do this, as already explained, is we will take five minutes each and speak about our perspective and why this topic of Indic heritage and the present day reality is compelling and personal to each one of us. Post which we'll go into groups and come back. Um, the design of the session as already shared is dialogue based. So I'll start with my, my perspective and a little bit of my story. No story is complete without the mirroring of the inner and the outer and mine is similar to that. I was born in Sanatan Dharm to parents who are practitioners of Vedanta. And uh, for those of us who are new to term the terminology or the idea of Sanatan Dharm, it basically means eternal dharma, which is ongoing and eternal order, inclusive of all class, caste, sect, uh, denotes a set of values and practices that are critical for us to live a fulfilling human life as well as for our spiritual development. Now, as I was growing up, I grew up literally in the lap of my Guru Sri uh, Shiva Bala Yogi Maharaj. And uh, me and my siblings had the privilege of reading and listening to stories of Swami Vivekananda, Thakur Sri Ramakrishna, Anand Mahima, Sri Aurobindo and Mother, and the wondrous yogic tradition of my country which I'm very deeply proud of and feel connected to. The other aspect of my life is that I come, my family's from the Defense Forces. My grandfather fought World War I and World War II, the celebrated army officer. My father fought 1962, 1965, 71 wars, and is also remembered as a man of valor and integrity. So these are my two influences, Sanatan Dharam and the Defense Forces. And as I was growing up, this presented a very rich field and does influence me even today, it has shaped me. So some aspects of my subconscious voice were, all faiths are personal and appropriate for those who follow them. We never use the expression secular till recently because my growing up was very inclusive and thus there was no, no need to talk about secularism. Uh, human character was always considered the key to progress, which meant determination, uh, being sattvic, uh, which can be interpreted as pure, or natural, or organic, or conscious, or strong, um, was expected in whatever we did. The other interesting bit, as I was thinking about today, was that the proof of the pudding for us was not in the eating. It was in the making. That is to say, what is my bhav or my sensibility when I think, articulate, do, or act? Uh, we were also very conscious that we were an army family and doing all of this within the Vedantic field, we were also an army family and we, we were at war uh, with uh, enemy countries and we had a very clear articulation of who our enemy was even as little children because I do remember crawling under beds and putting black paper on the window panes as I was growing up. I have a very strong Indian identity. I'm patriotic and very true to what Indianism means to me. And I'm very willing to expand that idea. And uh, my dharma is extremely critical to me. I'm still learning what it is uh, as we dialogue today. So now I believe I'm well educated, I'm successful, I've lived and traveled across the world. My life has been rich and confident. But somewhere along the way, I started to feel like I was not a part of the dynamic. And this was very odd because I felt like I was looking at cultures and communities, but I was not in them. So I had this peripheral view, uh, and this has been happening for say about the last seven, eight years. So in the West where I spent a lot of my uh, working uh, time, I was not a Westerner. I was a modern Indian woman, a woman who most people could relate to, but I was still not a part of the system. I was invited to the party, but I was not a part of the inner circle. In my own country, in my own land in India, I was seen to be not Indian enough. And I was often being asked, am I of mixed blood or that I look like a foreigner? Or if I, if I go shopping, 
people will ask me if I want to exchange dollars and speak to me only in English, um, which is why I will then try and don a sari and not uh, wear anything that is uh, uh, remotely Western when I'm out. When I was consulting, this had an interesting dynamic. Now I work with an organization, so it's different. I would be invited in with an expect expectation that I knew better because of uh, the fact that I had come back from outside the country. So, uh, in fact, there's a story when there was a magazine when I just come back five years ago, where, which was covering me and they asked uh, me not to wear my a traditional sari and wear a Western outfit because they wanted to pitch me as American returned. And it was extremely offensive, extremely, extremely offensive. But here comes the double whammy. My name is Preeti DeMello. And now with my second name, which is DeMello, I'm informed and I experience that I'm a minority in my own country. Where my ancestors have lived, plowed plow the land as farmers, water of enemies. God forbid if I were to go to a police station, I'd be treated like an outsider. So this is what's been going on within me. And all of this has created a deep sense of unease and led to sometimes adjusting, occasionally feeling apologetic, sometimes trying to be one with, Till one day I realized that I can no longer bypass all these signals and I had truly had a fit of deep rage and anger within me and I realized that my identity had been disrupted. I had, I had been busted and it was incredible, it, it now, well now it's incredible at that moment it felt really strange because it felt like there was I had a mask on all this time and I felt very responsible. I felt like I had a part to play in this. So sitting here with all of this, here is how I've made sense until now. And like Hari very well introduced the idea and said, we are all going to dialogue and come to a better understanding of ourselves and of our Indian culture through these conversations. Some of my ruminations and reflections are as follows. I'm a product of what I call whiteism. This by definition is a deep conditioning that comes from colonization and those colonized, where the oppressor is higher order and the one that we aspire for. It is actually the color of our inner preferred world. And I feel deeply uncomfortable even saying it. The truth to me is that my heritage of colonization has seduced my identity and I'm now holding the pain of trauma that I experience, the same kind of pain that we experience when we marginalize our own selves. And what I've unknowingly marginalized or suppressed has made its presence felt, you know, quite like the 13th fairy in Grimm's Sleeping Beauty. Ignore me and I shall arrive. It's interesting to note that it was always around me but I never saw it. For those who spoke about it, spoke with stories of survival, of resignation. In these stories, the colonizer was not given much importance. We, the colonized, coped and survived and marginalized our anguish. And the ecosystem was always defined by fatalism and outside our influence. So either we were quiet about it or we were like, like okay, things happen kind of a situation. The quality of reflection was hesitant and still is, and the quality of objection is missing. So resilience was misunderstood to be coping, which it's not. And what was deeply conspicuous was the absence of anger, the absence of outrage, the absence of any kind of objection. So in a sense, what has really happened, and this is my perspective and my story, is that the colonized and the colonizer had become one because it was too hard for us to see, the, see our part in this dynamic. We have adjusted our life principles to an extent that they are now mainstay. We have not been decolonized in our minds. We've been free for whatever number of years, but we are still quite there. And all at the same time, we are living in the paradox of what has survived, which is still very beautiful and honorable, the tradition of the Indic heritage, our spiritual masters, our innate deep intelligence, how we show up in technology, in medicine, healing, arts, education, amongst others. But alongside our muffled cries, our over-leveraged apologetic humility, 
our absence of ownership over who we are as people, our objection to what is not okay, what is wrong. Maybe it might be corruption or abuse or whatever. It's almost like we've, we've come to a place to say things happen and we're just going to keep walking along. So I'm going to wrap this up um, and say, why is this dialogue hard? One, it's inconvenient. It's an inconvenient truth, right? Let sleeping dogs lie, let's not bother and pretend that history has no role in heritage, which is that there could be nothing further than from, from the truth. It, it represents too muchness that is difficult to handle, too much honesty, too much strength, too much truth. Can't do it, it's painful. It also represents fear, shame, embarrassment. The dark side of the systemic breakdown of our people. Sometimes this is very hard to acknowledge. It also calls for change, which is hard for most of, most of humanity, because we have to let go of the status quo and we have to embrace a new reality. And we have to claim that part of us that uh, we've ignored and acknowledge that we are not victims, we equally perpetrated the situation. So I'm going to pause here and um, request Rajni to come in. The dialogue will continue. I think um, it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's a steamy, um, steamy gathering with a lot of emotion and heart um, in the conversation. And Rajni will bring her perspective of experience as well as perspective of history. Rajni, I invite you to please step in. Thank you so much, Preeti, and namaskar to everyone. Um, so I uh, had a very uh, a travel packed uh, childhood. My father was in the Reserve Bank of India and uh, by the late 60s, he got uh, recruited into the international development you know, networks, FAO, World, uh, UN, etc. So I grew up actually in uh, Kingston, Jamaica, West Indies. And uh, we were there when India turned 25. And we were there in Jamaica, West Indies when Jamaica turned 10. Ten turned meaning as an independent country. Okay. So, uh, and Bo, I must also mention, sorry, I should start by mentioning that I'm a product of a, a partition family. Both sides of my family came from what is now Pakistan. Uh, and like my father was not in the army, but uh, the army was a huge presence in my, uh, you know, immediate family. Uh, we lost an uncle, my, my, my dad's next, next to my dad brother, um, to a non-wartime incident, but you know, he died on army duty. So, and I have the same memories as Preeti of, you know, blackouts and, and all of that. And yet, I did not grow up feeling in any way embattled. Uh, maybe my years abroad had that effect because in fact, wherever we went in Jamaica, I mean, of course there were kids at school who said, oh, do you have tigers roaming around on the streets of Delhi or Bombay? If at all they knew even what were the cities. See, at that time people were much less informed than they are today. Uh, but by and large, uh, you know, we were looked up to. And uh, so many Jamaicans would say to uh, my father, and, and I would hear them, even though I was a child, I was only 10 or 11 years old, that, you know, India showed the way and that's how we got our freedom, etc. That whole legacy uh, was very much part of uh, my growing up. Uh, the other big influence was that uh, uh, the community I belong to, uh, the Tulsi Ramayan, is uh, is the air you breathe. The Gita is for much later in life, but uh, I mean, I grew up just knowing the rhythm, the cadence. I must say that I had not read it myself till 1992. That was my response to the... So actually, my first trauma is Ayodhya. For me, the first traumatic event in my adult life is the demolition and everything that built up to it. And the fact that people whose uh, sense of basic decency I had taken for granted all my life uh, suddenly began to say the most uh, shocking things in favor of mass violence. Uh, 
uh, and uh, that is when I, uh, you know, went looking for answers. Ke, you know, what is happening? And uh, so I, uh, 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 had very high levels of attainment. I think they are sort of born like that. Many of them. My great, my grandfather was like that. So one of them said to me, "Why don't you just read the Ramayana every day?" And uh, and that practice, which began in I think January 1993, still continues. I mean, I keep reading it over and over and over again. It's so I. Um, it took me a while to realize. Uh, I do know uh, the phenomenon that Preeti has so so evocatively and so poignantly. Uh, described. I have personally myself not experienced it in that way, uh, but I do feel very um, preoccupied with our inability to create our own terms of reference. And currently, the one that the thing that is agitating me most is the way in which we are unable to take the discourse on caste and see it in our own terms. Um, and I'll close by just, uh, because I've run out of time, sharing what a friend helped me to see that what is uh, parampara and what is adhunik. He said, see, adhunik is whatever you're trying out in the present. And in all, at all times, through our 5,000, 6,000 years, there are things that were happening that were only happening in that time. They were new or they were different or whatever. What we decide to keep becomes parampara. Parampara is that which is seen to work in some larger sense. And... Uh, the last thing I want to share with you, I, uh, the Ravindra Sharma of Adilabad was uh, one of my uh, great blessings in life. That, you know, I got to know him well before he was famous, I'm proud to say. So I'll close by telling you what he said, ki what is Adhyatma? He says it is that which enables you to relieve the pain of the past. to process the pain of the present and to overcome the fear of the future, which is actually, as psychologists will tell you, that's pretty much what human life is about. We are either living in, we are either being, you know, hankering after or being traumatized by something that's in the past or we are cribbing and unable to be in the present or we are obsessing about something that may or may not happen in the future. And, and so for me, this, these are my anchors. Thank you. Thanks, Rajni. Uh, Suki, are you, you're there? I can't see you yet. Suki, would you step in, please? Sure, hi. Um, so my name is Sukhvinda. Everybody calls me Sukhi and I like that. Eventually I'm arriving at that place. It seems to have been the journey of my life. And uh, also the work that I have been doing for the past decade or so is about bringing in the divine feminine back into the center of our lives. She had gone totally missing in my life. So um, there was this longing to know her and to meet her. And uh, I wondered what life would be like when she returns back to me. And the way I went about searching for her is to do it in a community of women. And some brave men also who arrived to do this work. So, um, and that, that reclaiming, which was very deep and very intense, because we had to enter into the fabric of patriarchy and unshackle some very, very deep uh, stuff, uh, gooey, sticky stuff. And 
and uh, so so that work became a very uh, powerful background for what was yet to arrive which was an even deeper cycle of pain that i stepped into so uh, it's not that i am any great authority on the subject of decolonizing it's just that my life experience took me to this place so i am only sharing my personal journey so um, so the, the the doorway to decolonization for me has been through my pain uh, when when i hit upon this this pain and i sat with it it was to do with the loss of rootedness in my own soil and in my own culture and uh, the pain of disruption of my ancestral story and tradition so i come from punjab and uh, though i have only gone there for vacation because like the two panelists before me my father was in the railways and we always traveling everywhere which is also a good thing for me because i went to so many places and was introduced to so many cultures so and i thought i had a privileged education because i went to good good schools but then when this when i entered this pain then i was really horrified to find that uh, this education actually didn't give me anything in fact it cheated me cheated me out of my heritage and uh, i really started looking at the whiteness inside which uh pretty you were talking about and it was really horrifying to see how white i was so though the whites have left our country and gone many years ago they left they left us behind they they were sitting inside and said uh we still have you so um so my journey of uh, decolonizing myself is actually a statement that i want purna swaraj of myself <laughs> i want to reclaim back the sovereignty of my life beautiful so uh like i was saying the education system cheated me it fragmented me you know education should be holistic the whole person and uh, at no point in my education did i find that the whole of me was included we had a uh, subject we had a class on history then it broke up then we entered into a class in geography it broke up then we entered into maths then we entered into literature so it was completely disconnected no subject is connected to the other so there was no beautiful you know seamlessness of what i was learning and today i realize what i had called education is actually indoctrination it was not education i was being indoctrinated by making me stupid i was being made stupid um so this process the more i i delved into it the more i connected to anger and grief so there there's a lot i can say about this so uh i was worshiping false gods whenever i wanted to learn anything whenever i wanted reference who would i turn to the white man the white man's knowledge the white man's books the white man's models and there was no doubt in my mind that this is what it is because they are at the forefront of thinking 
what is modern is best. You know, the whole concept of modernization, uh, it also cheated me. And I was told that my, the word ancient was replaced by primitive as a pejorative word. So the, so the pride was taken away of my existence and instead was replaced by shame and cringing and, you know, wanting Unconsciously, I was on this impossible agenda of becoming white. It is true, it is horrifying, but it was true. So the unpeeling of it is, I find that the tentacles of it are everywhere in my life, my lifestyle, my goals and aspirations. They have all been co-opted by the, uh, they have been kidnapped. My longings have been kidnapped. So, uh, and the kidnapper takes no responsibility for the trauma that uh, it has caused me. It's like uh, the spirit is kidnapped and we are told if you do this, then you are the performer. So my journey, my education turned me into a performer. And the lifestyle I was told to pursue turned me into a consumer. This world does not want me to find myself because that is will challenge the, this world wants consumers. So one thing which I personally started doing in a small way, and I think Raghu is also doing that, I started creating a village of people. Because colonialism thrives on keeping us separate. You know, divide and rule is a very deep thing. It's not just divide and rule countries and uh, divide and uh, rule uh, religious groups, but divide me into a thousand parts and make sure they never join back. So it's really a revolution to say, I want Purna Swaraj of myself. <laughs> so that's the process I'm in. And uh, I don't know, I think how much time I've taken. Maybe I should stop now, I can just go on. So uh, I, I would just like to end by saying that uh, let's bring the village back. Let's bring community back. And uh, who we truly are, what is our true identity, let us find that. I'll stop here for now. Thanks, Suki. Thanks so much. You know, there's so many things ringing true about what you've said, uh, and painfully so. I'm going to pass on to Naveen, and then we'll uh, come together and summarize our thoughts into one collective whole. Uh, Naveen? Yeah, thanks, Preeti. Am I audible? Yes, you are. OK, great. Um, my struggles with decolonization. Yeah, that's, uh, that's how I see this. And uh, basically I went, to a, um, I went to a regular English medium school, like uh, probably most of us on this call. And uh, supposed to be one of the best schools in the country. And uh, right till almost, and I went to an engineering college, a uh, very popular engineering college in the state as well. And right till my engineer, end of my engineering education, almost uh, the unquestioned way forward was the American dream. There, there was, it was almost like we were all fish swimming in the water that we didn't even question. You know, like right from school, the plan was that we should become engineers or doctors. 
and uh, my class usually had a good mixture of both you know people who got into medical school or engineering school and uh, as soon as possible get to the us either in your undergraduate self if you can afford it or uh, if you got your uh, engineering degree or medical degree in any of the indian colleges get to the us uh, as app for your masters and then never come back you know that's basically uh, the unsaid uh, motivation that we were all working towards so i was very much on that track uh, you know and by the time i was in 10th grade 11th grade i was already planning where i will do my masters you know undergrad to sawali nahi hai like you know but i i'll go to this college that college and i was not alone but something happened in my uh, th- third year of college um, some senior had forwarded this uh, this false uh, little piece by macaulay you know it's a very popular forward where apparently macaulay uh, went to the british parliament and said indians are the greatest in the world you know they have such good science they have such good uh, everything that we'll have to uh, somehow cheat them and destroy them so let's impose schools on them something like that so when i read that piece i was like wow it's unusual a britisher is like praising us this much you know this is like uh, because he really praises india for like 80% in that in that little forward that little piece that photoshop little piece right so i thought it was a little incongruous i've never heard of a britisher praising indian culture so much so i said let me google this so i googled it you know and i found the uh, the real speech it's called the uh, minutes on indian education the real speech by macaulay when i googled it it's very easy you can find it and when i read the speech i was shocked he was saying completely the opposite of what that forward said you know it said you know we're so uh, backward you know the entire uh, all literature in sanskrit and urdu or in other languages can't fit uh, you know a single library is not worth single uh, shelf of books in english you know our our physics will make high school girls giggle something like that he uses you know uh, and our medicine uh, our medical systems are like of a worthless so he basically has a very insulting sort of uh, description of uh, indian knowledge and then he says now we should go and civilize them because we can't we can't rule over them forever we should leave behind a class that can take care of themselves who will be british in 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 way of thinking you know it will be basically british inside uh, indian outside doesn't matter what you're outside so basically he says we can't rule over forever let's leave behind a class that can rule on behalf of us this angered me this shocked me until then i didn't care one bit but i i mean i knew uh, our our country had its own set of problems but i but i knew for a fact that what he was saying is not true about india you know that actually changed the course of my life because uh, you know thankfully internet had come by then so once i started googling and my world opened up until then i was only concerned about how do i make a career uh, but then you know my world opened up about globalization environmental degradation indigenous knowledge systems what not as i started reading more i started getting more and more angry with the dream that i was holding until at that point yeah and i said i can't live like this this can't be you know uh, the american dream started getting less and less enticing and you know again life works interestingly you know when you ask the right question doors open doors you didn't think existed start opening and i started meeting people uh, who had quit uh, the american life so to speak you know i'll keep it short you know the, the all the all the everywhere i wanted to be you know i wanted to go to harvard i wanted to work at the un uh, you know what not what not i started meeting people who had actually been in those institutions and quit those very uh, those very jobs those very uh, uh, positions those prized uh positions and come back to india indians you know who worked in those places but quit and come back and started doing things very different so it it, it got me very curious why are these people quitting you know what i'm aspiring to get to so i traveled i bunked college i traveled spent some time with them you know and uh, world view started changing so i'll cut the for you know so basically i said okay no more america this is not where i want to go uh worked in the corporate sector for a couple of years but it didn't it didn't though i earned a lot of money at that point uh, it didn't quench the uh, the deepest thirst of one you know in terms of meaning you know this was not the uh, the capitalist dream didn't do it either profits and growth primarily i was an environmental engineer so i could see the corporate green wash from up close you know uh, and profits and growth are pretty much what drives the at least you know as i understood uh, at least my company if not the whole capitalist structure so i said i'm going to quit and find another way of life 
So somebody said reference points. At that point, until at that point, uh, you know, the, the, the fundamental questions, right? Who am I, where am I, and why am I here? The answers for all this was coming from the outside. And it is coming from the West. America, you know, Britain might have been, uh, for some of you, Britain might have been uh, the heights of culture, but for my generation, I think Amer the American life defined pretty much everything. You know, so even who am I, where am I, why am I here? Uh, the answers came from there. So uh, I said, I have to search for another way of life uh, because this is not sustainable. Forget me. You know, I was making enough money. I was very happy. Great job, you know. Uh, but if all of us got stuck like this, the planet's going to go down the drain very soon. So I quit. And uh, then what do you do? You know who you're, who you're not. You know what you don't want. But then what do you want? What do you do with your life? You know, when you're 23 and uh, cut your source of income off and uh, don't resonate with... It's not just the capitalist world, right? The activist friends I was working with, even our sources of... Lib even our notions of liberation are coming from the outside. Notions, notions of justice, notions of rights. You know, so neither did I resonate with the capitalist as well, neither could I resonate with my activist friends because our idea of uh, social change and freedom and justice and revolution is also from the outside. So I'm stuck, you know, where do I go? So uh, cooked in that sort of uh, limbo for a while, for a long, long time. I spent uh, actually three years in a dark room wondering what the hell do I do with my life? Because I felt like Abhimanyu was stuck in the Chakra view and I don't know where to do. Thankfully, I met Raghu at, uh, after three years of being stuck in a dark room. And uh, looked like Raghu had gone through some similar experiences in life. Uh, so he, thankfully, he recognized whatever he did recognize. And he sort of mentored. And they were not, not just me. There were a few other friends like me. So uh, we uh, met Raghu and Sashi and uh, you know, started having these dialogues with them about what does it mean to live in a meaningful way in today's times. And that opened up a whole uh, journey of discovering the answers so who am I, where am I, and why am I here from the inside? Yeah, from inside out rather than outside in. So that journey has brought us to Ritambara, where uh, our quest is to look at what does uh, Swaraj mean, you know, truly, and Sarvodaya as well. Because I, I, think, I don't think Swaraj and Sarvodaya can be looked at as separate. You know, Swaraj and Sarvodaya, Purna Swaraj and Sarvodaya are connected. You know, my growth is connected with the growth of everything else, or... Uh, my well-being is connected with the well-being of everything else. So the journey that we're on at Ritambara is to help, uh, is to, to try. So it's a journey, right? It's not an end point. It's to continue to engage in this journey of discovering Swaraj and Sarvodhya. It's an ongoing journey. But also enable the village, the tribe, the community, the samudaya, samavudaya, the samudaya, discover it ongoing. You know, it's, it's an ongoing spiral. So that's the journey one is on. And it's great to have so many friends walking together and uh, great to see the, uh, the tribe growing. So thank you. That's in brief, the journey for the last uh, 14, 15 years. Ek one vas hai basically. I quit at 23 and 37 now, so it's one one vas. So it's, it's been a good ride. And thankfully, uh, life has been very kind and brought the right people, right mentors, right co-journeyers at the right time. So here we are. Thanks, Naveen. Thank you so much. We will go straight to your mentor now. Raghu, please lend your voice to this dialogue. Bring your perspective in. Okay. Uh, it's, uh, I, I, I actually don't know where to begin. Yeah, I had some ideas of where to begin. <clears throat> um, I resonate with Almost everything Preeti has said, most of what Rajini has said, uh, almost everything Sukhi has said, and uh, everything Naveen has said. Yeah. And uh, so, and I'm feeling very heavy. Okay. Uh, I, I'm just at the brink of tears. Okay. Uh, because all the sharing has been so evocative and you know, quite painful at one level. Uh, there, are, there are two, three threads that are running in my mind. So if I'm not coherent, just bear with me. Um, the, 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 the first things that... Um, I'll, I'll go just straight to some of the key things that I think are important because I don't want to repeat what 
people have said before because i agree with that 100 percent yeah and uh, yeah the, the the first time i actually realized where we were lesbians was actually if i go back 15 16 for some reason i used to be extremely attracted to the history of american indians native americans and i remember reading this book bury my heart at wounded knee and weeping you know profusely weeping profusely uh, if any of you would like to understand what colonization is the worst phase of colonization please read this book and it's not an easy book to get obviously because there are forces which don't want you to read this book this is a book of how america was conquered it's a book about treaties that were made with american indian chiefs from the east coast to the west coast and if any of you has read chief seattle's letter which is actually a, a whitened out letter actually his original is much more raw and powerful uh, that is not the most poignant statement okay so those of you who have read it will get a sense of what it's all about yeah and um, uh, what is happening today in brazil is exactly the same uh, the the native americans were given a, a chicken pox filled um, blankets okay by people who pretended to be religious people this is happening today in brazil covid is being used and other things are being used for the same reason on the same people and what is the world view of these people these people were bewildered just as many indians are bewildered by what is happening these people were bewildered because their belief is in what is called pachamama pachamama is like the goddess the, the green goddess and for them all earth is one all all life is one and all people actually pray to the same great being above right and this battle is what i see many of us caught in inside of us okay on the one side uh, we have bought into the colonized idea which is uh, my truth is the only truth individuals against individuals extraction success is equal to evidence that you have extracted a hell of a lot and been ruthless yeah now against this you have another world view which is crying out for attention this has been crying out for attention for 200 years this is a world view that says there is something very beautiful about the earth there's something beautiful about human beings and what makes sense is a way of living that is dharmic okay and the word dharma is actually a very simple word the word dharma simply says how do i live so that i can be happy and prosperous and while i'm being happy and prosperous can i make sure all the people around me are happy and prosperous and simultaneously can the entire earth be happy and prosperous it's a very simple easily understandable word but the fact that we have been made to think that this idea of the world is something shameful and not just us almost all indigenous people all over the world have been made to feel that this idea of life is shameful and what is great what is development is extraction individuality and acquisition now this is not an issue just for me because i've lost my culture or i've lost my religion this is an issue for the entire earth at this point of time if if polytheistic minds if minds that look at dharma in this way do not discover their voice and discover purna swaraj i think the earth is doomed i think i don't think it needs too much thinking to arrive at this point right so uh, what has my personal journey been after all this red indians and reading about black americans and what happens to them 
and all that stuff was to really understand what is happening to India. And, uh, you know, it's a crazy thing. In my engineering college, I was, uh, you know, uh, going, I, I, I was one of the people who might have got the governor's medal, except that I raised a question. I said, why are you teaching us? Because everything you're teaching us is relevant for countries abroad. Where do we apply it in India? And a few of us staged a small strike. So all of us were punished by our teachers for asking questions about the relevance of Indian education, education paid for by India to serve India. I was called and I was uh, uh, counseled because they knew my uncle. My uncle was a big shot in America. They said, you don't even have to pay for your education. How come you don't want to go to America? Something is wrong with you. So I was, I was counseled into thinking that America is the greatest dream. Yeah. And then I met up with uh, Dharampalji and Rajni and many people in that context, including Guruji and all of them. And it is shocking to understand the extent to which we read wrong history. And the depth of work done by people like Dharampalji is just inspiring, to say the least. To have gone, to have discovered what was India in the 1700s and 1750s and so on. And then <clears throat> he challenged a few of us, and I'm happy that we took up the challenge. He said, go and study what is Indian with a great teacher, but don't study to glorify India. Go and study to find out what there is in India that can be applied today for contemporary problem solving. And then when you go in and you discover the extent of science and technology and all of that that India had, it's just amazing. Yeah, and you keep running into people all the time when you're on this journey who just like my professors are trying to counsel me. So here you are, you're a guy with a good education, you've come from IIT, what's wrong with you? Why are you going and studying yoga? Why are you going and studying the Indian stuff? And not just people from, I don't know, people I know, right? So this whole attempt to try and reclaim Purna Swaraj is, is disrespected, right? Going back and studying Gandhi and understanding Gandhi has very few takers. I don't know how many people have read Swaraj, <laughs> Hind Swaraj, right? And so on. So it's, it's very strange that when you speak about India with pride, what you get is people responding to you with shame. And this is the depth of colonization that we face. The other thing that I have been coming across, which is very, very difficult to deal with, you know, uh, Suki talked about it a little bit, uh, Preeti talked about it, you know, uh, it's this whole thing that uh, has happened, which at one level is beautiful, another level is, is very weird. Uh, what I'm formulating now is an idea that says that uh, we have employed what is called apad dharma to conserve things. So it's actually quite incredible that after almost 800 years of steady attack, our culture still has a Krishnamacharya. Our culture still has scholars of tremendous depth. Right? How have they conserved it? Right? They've conserved it by doing something very strange. They hold all their deep Indianness inside, held inside, and present a face which is non-Indian. And if you're doing it consciously, it is upper dharma. And after having done it for some 800 years and odd, that seems to have become our dharma. So most people I know would privately talk about what is Hindu. They'd privately say, we have a great heritage. But 
they will not spend time to really understand what the heritage is they will not spend time to to confront the realities that we have they will not speak up from where they are with pride and i can give you hundreds of examples of this yeah of this fear of asserting oneself this fear of reclaiming what sukhi called the purna swaraj all this is internalized upper dharma which means those practices which you do in order to protect yourselves in times of danger so today even to discover what's our true dharma becomes a difficult thing so as indians we have two issues to deal with now one is to be able to look at ourselves without shame to honor the the, the hurts that we've been through to grieve through it and all of that the the second is to be able to look at ourselves and i'm not saying at all that india doesn't have a whole set of issues to deal with but i think it can only be dealt with through pride it can only be dealt with through purna swaraj i can only really deal with a problem if i can look at the problem from fresh eyes if i define myself with envy of the west or like today if i define myself through an envy of china i'm just going to destroy the culture right and the strange thing is i've worked in you know all kinds of levels i've worked with untouchables i've worked with uh, uh, people in the craft sector and all that uh, i don't think it's as difficult to get them to understand many of these things as it is to get a so called educated person to understand unfortunately resources and power is with the so called educated the macaulay internalized people right and yeah that's i mean that, that's where i am and uh, i think i should stop here <laughs> Yeah, there's there's so much to look at. It's we're just kind of not even scratching the surface as yet, right? So back to you, Preeti. Thank you, Raku. Thank you. Uh, you know, this is a this is a uh, on one level a painful conversation, on the other level a hopeful conversation. The depth of colonization, whiteism, education and indoctrination. loss of rootedness mobilizing the idea of greed and oppression uh a fear of reclaiming who we are the internal internalized upper dharma what's the loss of point of reference is another huge one what is the parampara we wish to create can we see ourselves clearly you know it brings me to uh, something very beautifully uh, uh put by shri aurobindo when he said that the nature of human development is not static how we grow and who we become is not static in fact it's so dynamic and because it's our innate nature to grow into the best version of ourselves uh we keep striving however it comes with disruption every now and then and in our case clearly when 80 of us get together to have a collective conversation we've all come together with with some aspect of this dimension that's within us or outside of us so uh, shri arvind goes on to say that this disturbance is a sign of a spiritual uh, shift in consciousness and led at the individual level but it's really a coming together of the self of the individual and the self of society he goes on to saying that the subjective state within the current when it turns inward when it looks within itself and says what is really going on towards that essential truth of the self and of things around us there is a opening of a possibility of a true spiritual age is to say that crisis does inspire some change or some uh, possibility of change and there's no denying we will all need to go back and consolidate these aspects within ourselves these aspects that we ignored we missed we neglected until we don't go back and dig into that oppressive conditioning we will not be able to get our strong voice back 
we'll have this feeble voice that we currently have or painful voice that we share in groups, but not our true voice of determination that we have initially and that we have spoken of as a people. And our identity will potentially continue to be dislodged if we don't claim that voice. So this is a good journey. The journey is a reminder to integrate this inner crisis, which holds potential and the opportunity to correct, to step into our dharma and integrate what we have missed, what we have marginalized. We were not only in a race and a rat race or whatever, we've done all of that. And then we started questioning, and this is pretty much like I think Mr. Vasudevan was speaking, right? And then you take a step back, and the one step back doesn't stop there. You keep taking many, many steps back until then you see that you, you're not cut out for this. You don't want to do this anymore. But what do you want to do? You don't know. And then you start looking for things, and slowly you take one step in the path, and one thing after the other that resonates well with you opens up to you, and you take further steps. And you feel nice. But I think we were a good homogeneous group from Bombay, uh, Hyderabad, as well as uh, Chennai. We all spoke in regional languages. That was beautiful, actually. Yeah. Uh, I would love to speak in Telugu if any of you know and speak, speak Telugu. I speak very little Tamil. So I, some, uh, uh, somebody spoke in uh, uh, Marathi Hindi, which is music to me. It's really nice. I felt like I was in Kolhapur. It was really, really nice to speak the, you know, that colloquial touch. And Balkiji uh, was wonderful. So yeah, so that's pretty much it. And uh, my, my own view of life, as I see, is uh, not like one of Prasthanam or something, but I don't want to be in this crazy big city business. You know, I've lived in Bombay, Madras, Hyderabad, and I see there are many things. I want to go to like a smaller town and live. And all of them, with the five of us, Ashish G included, they all felt pretty much the same thing. So at the end of it, when the clock was ticking 30 seconds more, we said, hey, you know, we all have something in common. Until then, we were kind of just froze. And then we saw that we know why we are here. We know why we are even signed up for this. That was a lot of speaking with that full stop, Aparna. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Aparna. Thanks. Anyone else wants to put their voice in and share? I have okay, something. I can add. Uh, I can add something from um, our conversation. I had a conversation with Leah, and it was beautiful. Uh, and we both kind of spoke on two different lenses: truth and reconciliation. Both. So I presented the truth of uh, colonization and why decolonization is important. And Rhea presented the consciousness of reconciliation, that the consciousness that the consciousness that created colonization cannot be the consciousness that can trigger decolonization, because in that, from that consciousness, you continue to perpetuate otherness and divide and rule, and then you and the um, the answer to this forced and uh, the lie that has been imposed on the Indian and any indigenous uh, culture of that they are inferior cannot be that they stand up and become warriors and then end up becoming superior. You know, then you continue to perpetuate that and you continue to engage into that illusionary cycle of creation and destruction on earth that has to be, uh, and Rhea put it this beautifully, that we have to play the bigger game. And that is true because where we are right now, in spite of all the history that each and every country on the planet has had and each and every civilization has played victim and perpetrators uh, time and time again. We are in the crisis of climate change. We are in the crisis of global destruction. We all are including Indians. We are in a state where as ancestors, we are doing a terrible job uh, for our descendants. So I think that consciousness of what, what consciousness can actually bring forth reconciliation I think that that dialogue is also important where we assimilate, you know, almost like, you know, and I presented the story of in our Indian, in, you know, that story that we have of churning of consciousness, that when you churn the consciousness, a lot of, with the truth, a lot of poison is also going to come. 
And like Lord Shiva, we have to develop the courage to drink the poison and digest it so that the reconciliation that we bring forth has to come from a consciousness of love and oneness. Otherwise, we go back into that cycle and then, you know, and then where does that cycle lead us? Really nowhere. So I think that dialogue, I'm, I'm sure that this is the first dialogue is of identification of the problem, but I hope that at some point, we add that also into the dialogue. Um, otherwise, where do we go from here? You know, you can't just go walking out of these dialogues full of rage and anger. And then whom do you unleash that anger and rage on? If nowhere else, like most Indians, we leash it, unleash it on ourselves. So, you know, that was an important thing that came up in our dialogue. That is absolutely brilliant, Seema. Absolutely, incredibly brilliant to think about, yeah, really, really major claps for you and Ria. Ria, I would love to hear your voice and uh, this seemed to have been such a rich conversation. Hi, Preeti. Hi. Um, hi. Um, yeah, I think Seema... Let's see your face, yeah. <laughs> Okay, okay. Hello. Hi, hi. Hi, hi. Um, you had to say profound things, no? <laughs> so we'll have to I see you like also. The things. I can say blunt things, you know. Um, uh, no, I think uh, this conversation, uh, uh, I would say I have a lot more questions. Uh, and somebody you know, at, uh, at to what end? Voice is breaking up, Ria. Okay. Is it Raghu, we'll have to do with the yeah, voice. Yeah, we'll have to do without looking at her. Okay. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Correct. Now that you know it's me, Raghu. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Okay, so um, so yeah, I think the the question that I had, you know, that uh, um, does it which side of the border we are? Uh, border is still on this one earth, you no? Know? So, uh, so what what about that third voice? You know, there is this one's voice, our voice, and what about the earth's voice? Where is that represented, right? And like this sub. Uh, Part of the Pachamama Alliance, uh, uh, the question that, you know, the, the letter, right? Like this person wrote that I had my great, great grandson in my dream and he asked me the question. And that's really the question that I face pretty much every morning. And he writes that my great grandson came in my dream and asked, uh, what did you do when you knew? You know, and uh, what am I going to say, right? And to what end this, what, what, I mean, I have questions like, what does it mean to be Indian and what does it mean to be human? And is it, is it a weighing scale, you know? And do we talk about, and I'm not making anything wrong. I'm just saying where, I, how I'm feeling, right? Like whether you draw, draw the line between this and that or that and this, finally it is a line drawn on this one earth. You know, and and I I always get get confused about you know on a one earth which is round, which is the other side. It's just a matter of how long you walk, right? So I'm I'm left with like a lot of such questions. And you'll have to discuss this, Ria. Hmm. I understand yeah. what you're saying, but yeah. we you know the the way in in my understanding. The way to get to reconciliation has to be through truth. And uh, Rajini can tell you about why the South African reconciliation thing failed. One of the reasons it failed was because the perpetrators never really owned up to what they did. And, uh, you know, th there has to be both. There has to be a giving up of the rage of the victim and there has to be a profound realization mm -hmm. on the on the part of the perpetrators of what they have done and 
half colonized countries like india na mm. we have to do both mm. now inside me there is both there is both the colonizer the guy who appreciates you know all that is western and the colonized the victim of this process mm. so i have a choice i i'm i'm a child of both cultures i can make this work brilliantly like rahman's music or i can screw myself up but if i have to make it work it can only be by owning up to both and from a place of pride it cannot be from a place of shame it cannot be from a place of running away none of that it's yeah. a difficult journey and we have to start and guruji can i ask you a question aparna here uh preeti Uh, let's just Aparna could be just take the questions and we'll bring you yeah. in. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, but I'm can holding you in queue. <laughs> queue for next. Um, can I speak? Uh, there's some. There's Satish waiting in queue. After which, that uh, Anil, the, the floor is yours. Satish, floor. Yeah. So I I wanted to point out an observation I made um, just prior to when Hari put us in breakout rooms. there was 85 of us on this session and as hari mentioned that we were going to get into breakout rooms the numbers quickly reduced and i wanted to to use an analogy to to explain what i'm seeing is that the mind in itself is elusive it doesn't like being caught in the act right and it's it's kind of like um, if you're looking for a thief while blowing the whistle the thief knows you're coming and the thief is going to hide and the 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 thought that comes to me is uh resonating ragu what you just said is that we are both the colonizer and the colonized and there is this part of us that does not want to question it there's a part of us that does not want to break out of the comfort that is that we uh, that we have in 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 being a little bit inert uh there is a uh, um there is a great sense of ease in in seeing the world the way we have seen it because that would invite lesser disruption and lesser chaos and the 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 and the only thing that i would have to say is that um sure it would take individual courage but it would also take a a, a compassionate and and uh, an encouraged community and village of people to really see this through because um of, uh, in an individual at an individual level i can work with my colonizer and work on not being the victim of its marginalization and as a community i would uh, be more than happy to find people who i could share that narrative with as well so so sim- simultaneous to making an observation also expressing my gratitude for hosting the event super thank you thank you but, yes and 60 staying back is very encouraging right yeah. right right it's very encouraging so this is anil um, in our group we were only two of us uh, me and anil and uh, there were many layers to this first and foremost sukhi uh, poon swaraj i think the punch line of the evening uh second i was in touch with my own unacknowledged inner rage when i saw the native americans confinement in phoenix or the aboriginals despair in northern territories in australia and i was sharing with anu that uh, in those days 20 years ago 15 years ago i wouldn't know how to uh, you know uh, handle that maybe you know ragu helped me the last 10 years face my own uh, inner rage and uh, to and i was i gave an example of how this is so insidious uh, it, it, most of the thing happens at a very subtle level and i and unless you challenge it head on with the person who is at a very subtle level doing it and i gave an example of a european i coach for four years and she brought it up like okay this is indian way and in a very derogatory way now i can she didn't know and rather knows that person i won't name that person here but uh, i i when i confronted her she didn't know what hit her because she thought i empathize another 
what nonsense is this? And unless you confront it right then and there, you can't get to reconciliation. And this is the shadow that goes deep. People are in denial. You have to shine the light and you have to shine the light when it happens with the people who otherwise are actually very nice. Otherwise, they're very empathetic, but they don't even realize how insidiously it is in their upbringing. That's yeah, that's that, that's the gaslighting process, Anil. And we've been so gaslit, na? Neither the perpetrator nor the other person knows what's hitting what's hitting them, na? Yeah. Yep. So we've got just a few minutes to go. Um, Aparna, would you make a quick point, and then uh, I'm sorry, your name is not showing, but your yeah, organization. Sorry, I signed it with the wrong account. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so Aparna first and then... Yeah, uh, I, just one quick question to Raghu Garu is that uh, why do you think, uh, you know, for the last few years, for the last four, five years, especially this whole, when you're talking about pride, this pride in, uh, you know, in the culture, in the tradition, in the texts, in everything Indic is going up. Do you think that also is a bit of overdoing that's happening? No, from I don't within? think so. I think it's a reaction to the underdoing that's been happening for a long, long time. I think it's a natural swing. And uh, we'll have to talk about this because, uh, you know, this is, uh, what's your discomfort with reclaiming no, that? No, no discomfort. I, I, I'm, no I'm discomfort. absolutely loving it. Fine. I always want it to be like grandmother. So let's, so I'm, so let's yeah. uh, uh, no, we'll have to look at this carefully, Aparna, because uh, I find this reaction happening all the time. The moment we say, can I look at it with pride? There will be some voice that says, oh, but we shouldn't look at it with pride. Or why are we doing this? Yeah. Uh, I'm but I'm not happy. saying I shouldn't look at it with pride. No, but just... it, it will swing. It will swing this way. And I'm not with some of the extreme stuff that's happening, which is just as stupid. But I live with it because it's, it's been, the spring has been down for so long. Yes. Uh, you can't expect it to come very nicely back to normal, right? There will be swings, there will be stupid things that happen in the side. That doesn't mean that many of us cannot act for reclaiming what is Purna Swaraj. We, we have to act for what is an honorable way of looking at our own culture. And believe me, I've been doing this for 45 years. Some of the most brilliant ideas of looking at the world, looking at management, looking at psychology, looking at the self are all there in our texts. We don't even know. So where is the question of pride? Half of us haven't even read enough to know what yeah. is there. Yeah. 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 So yeah. the first yeah. step is to really start to go and read. Yes. Go and start to find out what there is. Right. Although I must say, I feel very good. I feel right. And I feel very good on this path. Great. That's all I can say. Thank you. Yeah, over to next person, please. Radeshwari, would you yeah. like to go next? Yeah, I just wanted to share. Uh, I was very struck by the whole notion of pride. Uh, just a couple of uh, things I wanted to relate in terms of my journey. Uh, I worked in Canada for four years. And uh, when I went on the team, one of my Canadian um, teammates said, I was concerned about what teammate I was going to get. And he looked at me and he said, you're so not Indian at all. And I had, <laughs> deep, I had deep grief and shock and shame when he said that. And I sort of, uh, you know, realized how far I had gone in terms of trying to cast myself in that role. Uh, and it's been a clawing back uh, since then. And uh, a group of my nieces and nephews wanted to form a, a, a group to uh, you know, be more woke uh, among our uh, relative circle in the WhatsApp groups. And the first topic they picked up was caste. And um, it's the same topic that came up in our sharing group today. And uh, there seems to be such a, uh, such a loathing uh, and uh, such a hatred for, for this word. Uh, so many misconceptions about where it's come from. And, and uh, I had a deep discomfort with that because uh, okay, I'm upper caste. Uh, okay, I'm a Brahmin. Uh, but if I deny that, and if I'm not that, uh, then am I taking away a large part of who I am? 
and why should I feel not good about it? And this whole notion that, you know, let's look at it uh, with pride. Let's look at it without, I mean, pride is a very, you know, it's, it's kind of a long way away in the journey. But do we have to take all these aspects and look at them with so much of self-loathing and mouth what, you know, international journalists are telling us or other countries are telling us? You know, of course, I'm speaking, you know, you could accuse me of speaking from a place of privilege. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's something that creates a lot of discomfort within me. Uh, and it's, I'm just left with that question of what, what part of my identity is it? And uh, why are different people trying to make me feel ashamed about it? And am I feeling ashamed about it? Big, big, big question, Raji. Yeah. Uh, you have to go into all kinds of histories to find the origin of the word caste. It originally came up really big because of the reformation process. And it was, it was, it was a horrible history. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, that, that's a whole different topic. But the other thing is that this is exactly what I mean by Apad Dharma becoming Dharma. Because whatever is told about us by Westerners, by Western Orientalist scholars, is completely skewed. So if you want to learn more about it, read Balagangadra. Okay? okay. The, the, the second critical thing uh, for you to look at uh, in this whole process is um, pride does not mean not owning up to shit. Okay. Then the third thing, I mean, this is such a huge thing you're talking about. I don't even know how to address it. Yeah. But um, the, the, the understanding of caste as many of us hold it, now many of us English educated people hold it is completely wrong. Right. So that's the biggest gaslighting that has happened. It's uh, very useful for many, many vested interests for us to internalize this, right? And this is how the whole process of colonization starts, where your story is told to you through frames that are not yours, and then you internalize it. Yeah? yeah. So the first thing is, if you're a Brahmin, good for you. You've kept the culture alive. Second, if you're a Brahmin, you haven't gone about, uh, you know, doing half the stuff that you're supposed to have done. Third, I think there is also a collusion among other Hindus who don't know how to handle this because there's a shame of being Hindu. So it's quite convenient to shove it on to one person or the other. Right? And like Indians are very good at, you know, this passive aggression and being aggressive about their own people. So it's a very complex thing. Right. Yeah. And I think it has to be taken head on. It has to be understood. It has to be taken head on. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So with this idea of taking it head on, we've, uh, come to the close of our two hours and I think the one commitment that we can possibly make is that we'll meet again. Yeah. And uh, the conversation will continue. I think this process of uh, deep inner healing and reconciling with what we have created in cahoots with whoever our perpetrators have been over time uh, is a process. It's not a cognitive uh, switch. It's something that we will have to feel into, uh, uncover that deep shadow, pull things out. And, and strangely enough, it might show up when we're not looking. I have to say, for me, it showed up. I had absolutely no idea I had this going on inside of me. So with that, um, all five of us, uh, you know, offer you our gratitude. Thank you so much for joining us today for this dialogue. And uh, we have your emails. We will be in touch. 
uh, and we welcome you being in touch. You have our details. Please stay in touch and and keep the community conversation going. Thank mm-hmm. you very much. Brilliant. Thank you very very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Hari. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.